Hello folks, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church, the Southern Baptist Church, about 15 minutes from here in Lawrence, South Carolina. And I come out here, my friends, to the rest area to bring to you the gospel of grace, to preach to you the, the good news of Jesus Christ, to warn you about your sin, but to show you the Savior, to warn you to flee the wrath which is to come, to warn you about the effects of, of sin against the Most High God, but to tell you that God has provided a sacrifice in His Son. He has provided eternal life in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, many people are living for many things in this world. But are they? I'm sorry, sir, they don't work. They've been broken for a while. You have a good day. God bless you. But my friends, I, I want to tell you that people live for many things, but there are few who live for the glory of God. Few who live for the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friends, and that's what I'm out here to preach to you. Nothing else. I'm, I'm, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus and Him crucified. To tell you about the Son of God who, who came and condescended and became a man and lived a perfect life and died a perfect atoning death on the cross and was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. My friends, I'm out here to call out all sorts of sin, all kinds of sin, whether it be pornography or fornication or drunkenness or hatred or enmity, and to say that there is a Savior for sin. But if the Savior is rejected, there's only hellfire. There's only eternal damnation that awaits for those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, I want to turn your attention to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21, and the Apostle Paul says these words. He says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, this is verse 22, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and of crawling creatures. And the text that I specifically wanted to, to point out to you and highlight this afternoon is verse 21, which speaks to the rejection of God by sinful men. As I said a moment ago, people live for so many things, but there are so few who live for the glory of God, who live to preach the gospel, who live to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the true God. There is no other God but the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way, the only way of eternal life. But so few people just throw Him to the side, reject His message, and they live for other things. They reject God. Perhaps even those who are religious. There are many who are religious and they reject the true God. Oftentimes when we speak of men rejecting God, we immediately think of those secularists or the atheists or the agnostics in the world. But dear friends, there are many religious who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. For there are many different religions in the world, many trappings, many outward performances that a man can undertake. But even to narrow the circle further, there are many quote-unquote religions that claim to be the true Christian religion. Dear friends, we consider different groups like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, or we consider the Roman Catholic Church, which has a billion followers, but we, when we examine their doctrine in light of Scripture, we see that they are damnable and they bring upon the people who follow them eternal damnation. Because even though they profess to, and even though they have the outward trappings of followers of Jesus Christ, yet they reject the gospel of grace. They reject the gospel of grace. That gospel which exalts the grace of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 6 says that God has predestined his people to salvation to the praise of the glory of his grace. In other words, to bring glory to his grace. Because it is glorious. And to bring praise to his wonderful grace. In fact, listen, uh, the Apostle Paul said elsewhere 
in Romans, excuse me, in Acts 20, 24. He says, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. There are many who have the outward appearances of being Christians, but they reject the gospel of grace. That a man is justified freely as a gift of God's grace and not by their own performance, not by their own religious deeds, but by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, this speaks to the jealousy of God. That God is a jealous God. Jealous for His own glory. Jealous for His own vindication. Jealous for His own righteousness. For the praise that is due unto Him. And so He has so ordered salvation to be all of grace. And yet, even in that, in that state in which it is free, freely offered to sinners, they reject it and they turn from it. Because they love their sin. They love their sin. People do not reject the God of Scripture because there is a lack of evidence or because there is a lack of of truthfulness to the claims of Scripture. It is because they have sin before God, they have guilt before their Maker, and they do not want to deal with it. And so what they do is they will just simply throw it all away, throw it all aside, but that does not deal with the issue. That simply suppresses it. It's because they love their sin. They don't want to be rid themselves of their, of their sin. For that is what they they drank down like iniquity, or excuse me, like water. Scripture says they drank sin down as if it is water. They bathe in it, in the sewer and mire of iniquity. Listen, this is the words of Jesus in John three. Jesus says, verse twenty four: Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And in verse 19, the previous verse, listen to what he says. This is the judgment that the light is coming to the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Truly, they do not honor Christ because they do not love Christ, but instead they love the opposite. They love sin. They love iniquity. And that is why there is rejection of God. But there is hope for sinners. There is hope for those who love their sin and reject the Savior. And it is the miraculous work of God. God is in the, is in the business of doing heart transplants. But not a physical heart. It's spiritual, dear friends. It is a, it is a, a reworking of the nature of man. My friends, you must have a new nature. See, religion of the re, other religions of the world and other belief systems, they try to fix man and change his nature from the outside in. They begin on the outward performance and they work inward, but they never get to the heart. They never can change the heart. It is as if uh, someone was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer and they simply tried to treat it by taking Tylenol pills. It just doesn't work. It doesn't fix the issue. It needs to be radical. There needs to be radical treatment. And in the economy of salvation, there is radical treatment for the depraved nature of man. And it is the supernatural work of God to regenerate that dead sinner. And that is precisely, precisely what you need. You, he, you people here today who are hell-bound, you need to be born again. As Jesus Himself said in John 3, 3, that if a man is not born again, he cannot see God's kingdom. He cannot even see it. How can you enter into that which you cannot see? It's an impossibility. And because of the rejection of God, which men practice, they bring themselves into a state of futility. They bring themselves into a state of absolute foolishness. And that is precisely what verse 22 says, that professing to be wise, they became fools. How often do we find ourselves looking in the academic world, in the scientific community, people who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, reject even any notion of a, of a higher being, of the Creator of all things. And so we see a, a professing of all these people to be wise. They profess a wisdom. 
but it is a wisdom according to the world and they are actually fools. Friends, I want you to be saved from your foolishness. I want you to be saved through Jesus Christ, who is the wise God, the eternal God. And that is what I seek to do today. Yes, it is to make much of sin. Yes, it is to warn of judgment. And yes, it is to share the good news of hope in Jesus Christ. He is the beacon of hope. And outside of Him there is no light and there is no life and there is no salvation. So friends, just to note quite briefly on the text's context, this, ver this verse's context, the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 has already in verse 16 and 17 established his thesis statement for the book. He's established what he is going to take the rest of his time in this book explaining. He says in verse, six, uh, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And that is precisely what he is going to spend the rest of these chapters of this book explaining. And then he's going to even give the implications of it toward the end of the book. But he begins with the bad news so that people will understand the good. See, the word gospel is translated from the Greek word euangelion, and it means good tidings. Friends, the gospel is good tidings. What Jesus Christ has done is indeed good news. But for one to understand the, the preciousness of Christ, to understand the worthwhile nature of following after Christ, the beauty of Christ, you must first come to grasp the utter hopelessness of your state outside of Him. You must come to understand how bad you truly are and how great your sin is before the Creator. What doctor tells his patients of treatment options before he explains to them the diseases and the ailments with, with which they are, they, are, they are afflicted? So that's why he comes to verse 18 and he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So under the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul begins by explaining the bad news. And so he uses those beginning words for the wrath of God. The wrath of God is coming, dear friends. His judgment is coming upon the ungodly. And friends, if you're not in the ark of salvation, the flood of God's wrath will drown you. You will drown in His judgment. Friends, I don't want you to perish in your sins and go into the lake of fire for all eternity. I beg you on behalf of God, on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be reconciled to the Lord Jesus Christ. To be reconciled to your Creator through His Son. For there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He says in verse 19, he continues, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. And so in those few verses, He has explained the state of people who are outside of Christ, that they know, they know the Creator, they know who He is, and they know that His wrath is revealed against those who are ungodly. Yet they suppress that truth. And they reject that truth. And that's why in verse 20 it says, He has made known His attributes, who He is through nature. God has shown to us in the creation of this world, dear friends, just simply look around you. He has shown us His graciousness, His wisdom, His creative power. He has shown His kindness toward the children of men. Behold the trees, behold the grass of the field, the flowers which bloom. Behold the creatures of the, of the field, even the human body, its complexity. It testifies to the glory of God. In fact, that's exactly what Psalm 19 says, that the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens do declare that. And so that is a good context, a good understanding of what surrounds verse 21. And actually, he will continue on in verse 22 and 23 and so on, all the way to the end of the chapter, 
describing the, the hopeless, helpless state of those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, who reject the God whom they know to exist. He will continue the rest of this chapter explaining that truth, explaining that reality. But let's look at verse 21. Let's look at the rejection of God. The rejection of God. Verse 21, For even though they knew God, as I said a moment ago, God has revealed Himself to you in what is called general revelation. That is that God has clearly shown us in the creation of all things His glory and His power so that men are without excuse. Indeed, men do know God. In fact, it's quite odd because preachers will oftentimes ask a sinner, well, you need to have a relationship with Christ or you need to know Christ. You need to know the God of Scripture. Well, they forget that in a general sense, men do know the God of Scripture, but they reject Him. They do have a relationship with God, but it is not one of peace. It is not one of right standing. It is not one of friendliness. It is not a, a father and son relationship or a father and daughter relationship, but it is a relationship of enmity. It is a relationship in which God and the sinner are at war with one another. And surely that is a horrible relationship to be in with God. And so what I call you to have today, dear friends, is not a, a relationship with God, for you already have that. But it is, a, it is a right relationship, a right standing before God through Christ, the mediator. So he says, for even though they knew God, he says they did not honor Him, and literally translated that's glorify Him. They did not glorify Him as God or give thanks. Two things he lists there. Firstly, they do not glorify God. And then secondly, they do not give thanks. So, even though people know the Creator and they know His righteous decree, they know that He is righteous. You may ask, well, how? How do we know that he, they know that He is righteous? Well, the text says it at the end of the chapter. In verse 32, it says, And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So people know the just, the, the just punishment for sin. They know that they are accountable to the Creator. In fact, that is what we, had, we would call a conscience, which is Latin for with knowledge. Con fide. With knowledge. Of, who, of what specifically? Of right and wrong. God has created each and every one of us as His image bearers. Dear friends, we are set apart from the animals which God has made, which the creatures, the creatures of the field which He has created. Humankind has been set apart by God to bear His image, and they have a moral capacity. People know that it is wrong to lie. People know that it is wrong to steal. People know that it is wrong to murder. You do not have to teach a child those things are wrong. You might have to teach a child not to do those things. But people are born with the inherent knowledge of right and wrong. It is because God has made it evident to them. Simply survey all the cultures of the world, con different continents and different countries, and you will find a uniform agreement among humankind that these things are wrong because God has made it evident to them. He has made it evident to every one of us. But as the text reads, it says they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. So let's look at that first one. They did not honor Him as God. They did not, or as the text would be better translated, glorify Him as God. Dear friends, how many people, as I open this sermon, I began with saying and lamenting that there are many people who live for many things, but how few live for the glory of God. How few live to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friends, that is the purpose for which I am out here. To see you live for the glory of Christ. To see you not live for yourself, not even live for your spouse or your children, or to live for any material gain or, or any hobby or, or interest that you may concern yourself with in this life, but to live for the glory of God. 
For that is the chiefest and greatest end to which you can live. How many consider not God? How many simply forget the Creator? To, to forget all the time about God and only make mention of Him perhaps every Sunday at church? Or perhaps they don't even make mention of Him there. What a horrible state that is. What a horrible place that is to be. And then secondly, he says they did not give thanks. And this speaks to the, the ingratitude of sinful humanity. This speaks to the ingratitude of sinful mankind. How often do people express ingratitude to God? But how, how rare do we see men and women who express gratitude to the Creator? For what He has done, for who He is, for what He has made, for His glorious Word, for the precious Gospel message. So few. So few. And this again, as with everything that his, Paul has said in this chapter so far, well specifically this section of the chapter, speaks to the depravity, the fallenness, the wickedness of man. Truly men are, are depraved and they are in need of a Savior. They are in desperate need of salvation. And the text goes on, it says, But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. My friends, as you continue to reject the Lord God, as you continue to reject the Gospel, what will happen is your heart will just become more darkened and more evil. There will be more hardness heaped upon your soul. And you will become futile in your speculations. Look at our society, dear friends, today. What, what a perfect display of this text. That when people reject the Lord Jesus Christ, when a, when a group of people, even corporately as a society, reject the authority of Scripture and reject the Lord Jesus Christ, nonsense ensues. Absolute nonsense. I mean, 50 years ago, the idea of a, a man using a woman's restroom would not even have been conceived in the minds of the most wicked people. And yet, here we are today. People telling children they can choose what gender they are, even though biology clearly shows you what gender you are. Or the sexual revolution that happened in the 60s which created a, a huge culture, especially in the United States, of perversion and sexual immorality. How many people these days are addicted to their cigarettes and to their drinking? They're enslaved to their pornography. Friends, we as a society are headed downhill very rapidly, and it is only accelerating. Why? Because the text reads, they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. That happens to both individuals and corporate entities. That is a nation or a whole society when they reject the gospel message, when they harden their hearts to the God of glory. Chaos ensues and there is depravity upon depravity upon depravity. How do we know this? How do we know what sin specifically is? I've spoken on the wickedness of man, but how do we know what sin is? What is the definition of wickedness? Well, briefly put, that which is wicked is that which is in contradiction to the character of God. That which is in contradiction to the law and the written will of the Lord of hosts. See, God has not only in creation, not only in the general sense, made known His characteristics. <laughs> But He has also in specific revelation, that being the Word of God, He has put forth the revelation of His will for men. He has put forth His law, His commands. They sh they, he says, you shall not lie, you shall not steal, and so on and so forth. But why does God say those things? Why does God put forth His will for people to obey? It is because His character it is because of His character. See, God is a holy and righteous God. He is the creator and um, sustainer of everything. 
But we must understand that He is pure and holy. In fact, I would submit to you that the, the most terrifying truth in all of Scripture is that God is good. Because men are not good in light of the righteous character of God. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 137, he says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. And that word righteous simply means right, that which is upright, that which is according to that which is good. It is pure. God is righteous. God is holy. And that is a cause of great fear for the children of men. It is true that God is gracious and compassionate. As I mentioned earlier, it is clear in creation, even apart from specific revelation, that God is gracious and compassionate. Scripture says in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love, but His love, His love is never to the contradiction of His righteousness. God never negates or throws aside one of His attributes for the sake of the other. But they are perfectly in line with one another. They are in perfect unison. And we will see how that is in the Gospel in a few minutes. But we must understand the holiness of God. And the word holy means separate. It means set apart. God is perfectly separate and set apart from all that is evil and all that is wicked. Perfectly. And that is why He has put forth His law. In fact, Scripture describes it as the holy law. The holy law of God. See, the law is not bad inherently. The law is good because it shows the goodness of God. For example, let us behold one of the commands. God says that you, you shall not commit adultery. That is, you shall not cheat on your spouse. But that is such a glorious display of the faithfulness of God. Why does God call spouses to be holy to one another? Or to be, um, excuse me, not holy, but to be faithful to one another. It is because He is faithful. It is because He is continual. And He never changes. Another command, God says you shall not lie. Why is that? Because He is not a liar. He cannot lie. Another one, God says you shall not steal. Why? Because God is not a thief. Dear friends, God is perfectly holy. And this law He has given is absolutely holy. There is not a spot or there is not a blemish in it. There is no fault in God's law. And the law is a mirror. The law is a mirror which shows us the character of God, but it also shows us something else. And it shows us our character in light of the character of God. It shows us our evil in light of the righteousness of God. Consider with me for a moment, my friends, those same commands we just looked at. Lying. Oh, how great of liars we are. How many countless times have I lied in my life? And have you lied in your life? And because of that, you are a liar in the eyes of God. You are someone who bears false witness and you're an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. God said you shall not steal. I know that in my life I've stolen. So because of that, we are thieves in the eyes of the Holy One. In fact, Scripture describes the Lord Jesus Christ when He comes in glory as having eyes that are a flame of fire. He has a burning anger against the wicked. That other commandment we looked at, you shall not commit adultery. People will be very quick to say, well, well, of course, I've never committed adultery. In fact, I've been faithful to my spouse for the entirety of our marriage. Or perhaps those who have yet to be married, perhaps boyfriends or girlfriends, they say, well, I've, I've been faithful to my, uh, my boyfriend or girlfriend. I haven't cheated. Listen to what Jesus says. In Matthew 5, 21, He says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder. That's one of the Ten Commandments. And whoever commits murder shall be, um, shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong text. It's verse... Uh, it's verse um, 27, I'm sorry. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
And then listen to what he says in verse 29. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. See, friends, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. He sees the intent of your heart even. He even sees what is behind that, and that is your intent. And you know what he sees? Evil. He does not see good. He does not in see, see inherent righteousness. He does not see that. He sees wickedness upon wickedness upon wickedness. He sees your vile wretchedness. In fact, this is what's so astounding. Scripture not only says that your evil deeds are an abomination to God, but even your righteous deeds. Because no one can do any, even anything perfectly righteous. Consider for a moment the command that God gave. You shall, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Who has done such for even a split second of their entire life? No one. No one. There may be some who have done that halfway, some who have done 80%, but 100%, perfect purity before God, perfect love and devotion to God, absolutely not. Even our righteous deeds are mixed with evil and wicked intentions. And therefore, even our good deeds are seen as tainted, are seen as evil in the eyes of God. And so there's no hope. And God, just like any just judge would do, just like any just magic magistrate here on earth would do, He must punish the lawbreaker. What would you think, my friends, if you read in the news about a murderer here in South Carolina who was let off the hook and was never punished? You'd be angry. You'd be upset. There'd be people protesting and calling that the judge who let that person off should be thrown off the bench themselves and never allowed to practice law again. And yet people think God, the Creator of all things, who is infinitely more perfect and infinitely more righteous and infinitely more holy, is going to let people off the hook. Is going to simply and arbitrarily forgive sin. Absolutely not. God is holy and He does not wipe sin under the rug. He cannot... To do so would be to compromise His very character. To do so would be to contradict who He is. And so the just punishment, the just penalty for sin is hell. Just as we read in that text there in Matthew 5, He says, it is better for you to lose your eye than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. It's better for you to have only one eye and go to heaven then have your whole body and be thrown to hell. Hell is horrible, friends. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said it is the place of outer darkness. He said hell is a place of torment. It is the eternal fire, the eternal flame. And I do not want you to go there. That is why I'm here. That's why I'm standing out here at an interstate rest area. On a Tuesday afternoon, friends, because I care for your soul. I care for where you're going to go. I care for your eternal state. I do not want you to go to hell because I know it's real and I know that Jesus said in Matthew 7 that there are many who will enter through the broad gate and will go to destruction. And I do not want that for you. So we consider and we think, so man is without hope. He is condemned unto hell. And God is just in doing so. But what do we do with the Scriptures that say God is abounding, abounding in loving kindness and He forgives sin? What do we do about the text of Scripture that we read in the Gospels where Jesus forgives sinners and lets them off of the hook? How do we reconcile God's righteousness with God's grace? How do we reconcile the holiness of God with the love of God? That is where the cross of Jesus Christ comes in. This is where the gospel message steps onto the scene and answers the question with the utmost precision. My friends, the gospel message is the answer to the great dilemma. How can God be a just God and forgive you, someone who is so evil and so wicked and so ungodly? How can God do it? How can God forgive men who are men, as, as verse 21 says, that do not honor Him and do not thank Him, but instead reject Him and therefore their hearts are darkened? And that is where the cross of Jesus Christ comes. 
There is nothing like this anywhere in the world, in any other religion, in any, any other culture. It's not found because this is something that is not of the creation of men or the brilliance of man's mind, but it is of the, the brilliance, the wisdom, and the power of God. For us, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the Apostle Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But listen, listen to what he says. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And the Greek word he uses there is dynamos. That's where we get the word dynamite from. It's the explosive, life-changing, radical power of God. The cross of Jesus Christ. So let me explain to you in these moments, these most important moments, what the cross of Jesus Christ is. And if you perhaps have attended church many years or perhaps your whole life and you've never heard this, I pity you. I pity you to the uttermost. And I say, never go back to such a place that does not preach this. But nonetheless, what happened was, in Galatians 4.4, 4, the Bible says, When the fullness of times came, at the right time, God sent His Son. Jesus came, God condescended. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal God-man comes and is, is made flesh. And he, he takes upon Himself this lowly position, this humbled position. And He lives this perfect life. The Bible says in Matthew 5.17 He came to fulfill the law. In Matthew 3 it says He came to fulfill all righteousness. He came to live in perfect, absolute, complete obedience to the law that we broke. Consider that, my friends. Think about that for a moment. That command that I brought to your attention earlier, where the, the command is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Who can do that for a split second? Not a single person. No one ever has and no one ever will. But Christ comes in and every moment of His, of his life on earth, every second, He loves the Lord as God with all His heart, with all His soul, with all His mind, and with all His strength. He pleases the Father. And then He is stretched upon that cross. And before then, He is whipped and He is beat. He is mocked. He is betrayed by His own disciples. And He is nailed there upon the cross. And Isaiah 53.10 says, It pleased the Lord to crush Him. It pleased God's just, justice to crush His Son. In that same chapter in Isaiah 53, it says, Because of the anguish of His soul, He will see it and be satisfied. By His knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Christ's soul was in agony those hours upon that cross. And He takes upon Himself the, fuel, the full fury, the full hatred of God against sin. That is the love of God. That is how much God loves sinners. That He would put His own Son, that He would put the One whom He loves upon that cross and slay Him instead of filthy, vile wretches. The innocent dies for the guilty. The just for the unjust. The righteous for the unrighteous. The Bible says He is the Lamb of God. And His blood was spilled at that cross and he cries out in those last moments, It is finished. To tell us die. One word. In the original language, one word. To tell us die. It is finished. It is paid for. It is gone. The guilt for God's people is paid for in full. And praise be to God, he did not die and was simply laid there in that tomb and remained there and is there unto this day. But no, he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. He was raised. And that, that resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is a display and a public display that God accepted His atoning work. That God accepted His sacrifice as the sufficient payment for sin. So how can I be quiet? This is the good news. This is the greatest of all news. What's that? What's that? You're a minister? Yeah. Really? And what, what denomination? What church? Baptist. I'm a Southern Baptist. You, you, you're doing a good thing, but you can't save nobody. It's Wait a second. You're a minister? The Bible says The Bible says a man should humble himself in his own secret closet. This ain't your closet. That, you're talking about, you're, you're quoting from Matthew 6 where Jesus talks about prayer. Yeah. I'm not praying. But that's the thing. Your message. What are you talking about? That's nowhere in the Bible. The people come to use the bathroom. They didn't come to hear that. 
they come to stop and use the bathroom and go on by. So when Jesus says, when Jesus says there are many on the road to destruction. How many times have you paid your tithes and offers? What do you mean? What are you talking about? How many souls have you saved? Uh, none. I can't save any. Hey, well, so when Jesus says, Matthew 28, we must make disciples of all nations. Sir, you're a hypocrite. You need to be saved. You are a hypocrite. The religious hypocrites are going to have a special place in hell. I don't want you to go there. Hey, why does the Bible say the word of the cross is foolishness? It's fool The word of the cross is foolishness to sir, because you're a hypocrite. And you're on your way to hell. You're on your way to damnation. That's why, because you're a hypocrite. That's, that's exactly why. Because you're a hypocrite. I've been, I've been flipping through the scriptures and quoting them. Sir, it's because you're a hypocrite. You're guilty before God and you know you're on the way to destruction. The word of the cross is foolishness to you. It's foolishness to you because you're perishing. You're on, you, and you're headed there and I don't want you to go there. You need to repent. The God is eternal life for those who confess and believe. Not if they're hypocrites, though, because that's a false confession. You are. You're a hypocrite. Because you you consider the word of the cross foolishness. Who out here listening to that shit? Nobody but you. What? James, what does James 2 say? The tongue is a fire. It don't matter. What comes out of the mouth, what comes out of the, what comes out of the mouth is what's hidden in the heart. Why are you using vile language like that? I can. I'm a grown man. I'm a grown man. And a minute. What church do you, are you a pastor at a, what church are you a pastor at? I'm a grown man. You recording this. I'm a grown man. You got video. You have a grown man. What church are you the best? Sir, I can, I am shot. I hope you're not in the Southern Baptist Convention. We'd have to kick you out. <laughs> Sir, I, I am astounded. You need to repent and believe the gospel. You need to be saved from your hypocrisy. God has a special place in hell for hypocrites, sir. Believe upon Christ truly. Be saved from your hypocrisy. Oh. That is astounding. I have no, I have very little grace for those who claim to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, but they are hypocrites. I have very little grace for those who re claim to represent the Lord Jesus Christ and claim to represent the gospel and claim to, to be believers in the truth of Scripture, but they, hypo they are hypocrites. I want to say this, if you have been ever abused or treated wrongly by someone who claims to be a Christian, they're surely not a Christian. If you've grown up around people who are hypocrites, said they were Christians but they weren't, they weren't truly Christians. They weren't backsliders. They were not saved. They were not converted. And you can be sure of that. And so friends, as I was saying, Christ was raised on the third day. He was exalted in heaven. And He is seated there now in heaven. And the Bible says that what you must do to be saved, what you must do to be saved from your sin is to repent and trust on Him alone. Jesus says in Mark 1.15, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe it. Believe that Jesus died and was raised on the third day. Believe that your sins are forgiven because of Christ's atoning work. Repent. Flee from your sin. Flee from your rebellion. Flee from your idolatry. And trust on Christ alone. Flee your, your, your lying and your thievery and your selfishness and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16.31 says, Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Listen to uh, Romans 4.5. It says, But to the one who does no work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Salvation is all of grace. 100% of God's free grace to sinners. Grab hold of the free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. It has made a, been made available. The, the outward call of the gospel has gone forth this day. Dear friends, believe the gospel message. Believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Son of the Most High God. And place your trust in Him today. And you'll be forgiven of all your sin. And you'll be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. God will treat you as having lived Jesus' life because He treated Jesus as having lived your life. That's the exchange of the Gospel. That Christ takes my sin 
that Christ takes my filthiness and my guilt and I get His righteousness. My friends, what sin is worth going to hell over? None. Whatever sin you're clinging to, let go of it and cling to Christ. He is worthy. He is worthy of your glorifying Him, of your bringing honor to Him, and your bringing praise to Him. In fact, as, we are, as we've looked at this passage in Romans 1, verse 21, that it says those who are lost did not honor God and they do not thank Him. Dear friends, I challenge you to do the inverse of this. Give thanks to God for what He has done in Jesus Christ. Give glory to God for what He has done in Jesus Christ by coming to God through Jesus Christ. If you want to please God, if you want to honor God and glorify God, then come to Him through the mediator of the new covenant. Come to Him through the, the shed blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have your sins been washed away by the Savior at Calvary's cross? So dear friends, I want to I want to challenge you and plead with you that you would do that. Time is running out. Judgment day is coming. The Lord Jesus Christ said in, in, in the book of Revelation, He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. He is coming very quickly, dear friends. And on the day of judgment, if you are still rejecting Christ and you are still turning away from the Gospel, then judgment will come. And it will be too late. There will not be a second chance at that point. So come to Christ today. Believe upon Christ today. He is worthy of glory. But I want to, in these moments, these closing moments, address you who claim to be Christians. You who are, who are maybe out here today and you claim to be followers of Christ and you say you're followers of Him and you, you say you believe the Gospel. Well, I want to ask you this. Do you bear fruit? Because Jesus says in Matthew 7, that's how we will discern the validity of your faith, whether you bear fruit or not. The whole book of 1 John is about this very issue. Do you bear fruit? Do you obey the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you live in obedience to the work of Christ? Do you live in submission to the will of God? Do you love to read His Word and to pray and to meet with His people? And to, to go and to, to meet with the fellowship of the saints? And to put to death sin? Or do you instead just love to live in sin and say you're a Christian so you can appease your guilty conscience? Dear friends, that is a hypo that's a hypocrite. That's not a Christian. A genuine Christian lives in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. They live in obedience to the will of God. Not so that they may be saved, but because they are saved. We are not justified by our works, but our works evidence the fact that we have been justified by God's free grace. Are you a hypocrite? Are you a Christian hypocrite? Turn from your sin and believe upon Christ for eternal life, for life. For He is the way and the truth and the life. Perhaps you're even, maybe even a pastor. There's a man that just came by, says he was, apparently. And you're a hypocrite. Then turn. Turn from your hypocrisy. And be saved this day. Don't continue on in your sin and be damned. Be thrown into the lake of fire. Don't continue on in your pornography and your drunkenness, your hatred and your enmity and your strife and your jealousy. Be saved through Jesus Christ. Do it all for the glory of Christ. God is again, as I said earlier, jealous for His own glory. Jealous for His own honor. And God has so ordered salvation to be all of His grace so that He gets all the glory. So that God gets all the glory. That's ultimately what it is about. God works all things to the end that He Himself might be glorified in all things. And friends, friends, you must understand this. 
It's not 90% God's glory and 10% man's. It is all of grace so that God gets all the glory. Listen to Ephesians 1.6. Paul is speaking of salvation here. And he says, God has ordered salvation. And then he says in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Indeed, it is for the glory, it is to the praise of the glory of His grace. So I say, O come to the Father through Christ Jesus the Son and give Him all glory for great things He has done indeed. So my friends, we have seen here in Romans 1, in Romans 1, 21, we have seen that sinful man, even though they know God, they know who He is, that they did not glorify or honor Him as God, but they... And it says they did not even thank Him, but they became futile in their speculations. But friends, there is salvation from this horrible state of sin, and it is by the free grace of God and it is for the glory of God. And it is all in Christ Jesus. So come. So come. Come to Him today. As a gift. And receive, receive His gift of grace. Receive His gift of grace which has been given freely. Do it all for the glory of God. Give God glory, my friends. Give God all the glory, for He is worthy of it. Indeed, I say to Him be glory. To the God of creation, the God of salvation, and the God of all grace, be glory, honor, and praise forever through Christ. Amen.